Hello and welcome to our third panel of the day. Uh, my name is Lewis McClellan. I'm the editor of the Digital Monetary Institute here at ONFIF. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our discussion of stable coins and their role in the financial system. It's an extremely timely topi topic this week uh, since we're witnessing in real time the, the collapse of one of the largest stable coins in the world. I'm talking, of course, about Terra. Uh, which the last time I checked uh, had lost about 70% of its market cap, um, which is value destruction of uh, well over $10 billion. That's probably out of date because uh, things are moving, moving very quickly, but it's certainly very considerable, very painful for those unlucky to be invested in it, which is a real who's who of the crypto VC and, and investor community. Um, we'll be discussing that in, in more detail on, on the panel today, but uh, first I'll give my uh, my fantastic set of panelists here the, the chance to introduce themselves and, and say a little bit about their uh, involvement in the sector. Uh, Christian. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, Christian Catalini, I'm the founder of the MIT Crypto Economics Lab. I've been working and doing research in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space since 2013. I was also involved in the design of Libra, then DM as one of its co-creators, and then as the chief economist of the DM Association. As we uh, ended that project, uh, I'm, I'm now back doing work on, on, on this area uh, from a research perspective. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Antoine? I'm Antoine Martin. I work in research at the New York Fed. Um, I have a background in payment economics, so I've been quite interested in following the developments of digital currencies in, in recent years. And in particular with uh, my colleague, Michael Lee, but a number of other co-authors as well, uh, I have several uh, blog posts on the New York Fed's Liberty Street Economics blog on topics like crypto, uh, stable coins, and CBDC. Thank you. And uh, Duncan? Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Duncan Fitzgerald. I'm a, a partner at PwC. I work in financial services, governance, risk, and, governance, risk and controls. Um, I started my work in digital assets, crypto, back in 2017. Some of you may remember the headlines of PwC accepting Bitcoin as payment for settlement services. Uh, for my sins, that was me. Uh, it was my job that we accepted a, a Bitcoin on. Um, I also worked with PwC on the work with uh, HKMA, Bank of Thailand, uh, PBOC in China and the UAE on their multi-currency central bank digital currency bridge. Um, and more recently, I've been involved with PwC and helping PwC uh, buy land on the sandbox metaverse. I think we're the first professional services firm to uh, enter the metaverse uh, and we're uh, I'm helping lead the strategy and the change that we've got on there. So I'm very looking forward to talking about stable coins and CBDCs today. Excellent, thank you. And last but not least, Anastasia. Hi, I'm Anastasia Tracy Rices, and I am with Amazon Web Services Worldwide Public Sector, and I'm the director covering international public sector financials. I lead teams focusing on SDGs, ESGs, and green finance, supervisory technology, or what we call subtech, and digital assets, including central bank digital currency. I think we can we can all agree that. Increased digitalization is transforming the payments landscape. And that being said, central banks are in particular operating in a ch quickly changing environment, which requires them to learn and respond uh, to emerging issues with accelerated speed. At the same time, combining that with a recent report by the uh, UN uh, Secretary General's Task Force on uh, Digital Financing of the SDGs, which stated that digitization increases the potential for the financial system to better serve the interests of the people within those financial systems. Those are key driving forces for me uh, as, uh, as my team partners with central banks to support their efforts. As their tech enablers, we listen to our central bank customers and are excited about the opportunities cloud technology solutions present to manage their risks and achieve their goals, including around central bank digital currency. I'm really excited about this panel. Um, as mentioned before, this is a very timely panel and I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Thank you, thanks very much. Um, well, just before we come on to the, the issue of the day, which is the, the Terra and its collapse, uh, I'd like to start off by taking this opportunity to define a couple of terms. Uh, I think the term stablecoin is, is used to denote quite a broad range of instruments. What we're talking about uh, is essentially a, a DLT token provided by a private company where the value is uh, pegged to something external, typically a fiat currency. Um, but you know, beyond that, I think there are a lot more subtle uh, distinctions. Uh, Duncan, can you break down some of, some of those for us? 
Um, so let's let's start with that. Uh, you know, we've we've got various levels of knowledge uh, in the audience today, and all, and 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 the panels are, are, are experts. But what does a layman think about what is a stable coin? Now, when I started in this area, I thought a stable coin pegs the U.S. dollar. Meant, oh, it's backed to 100% by U.S. dollars. So that, what does that mean? Does it mean it's backed by 100% with bank deposits in U.S. treasuries? Well, I thought so until we get into it. And then you realize, actually, even some of the more infamous or famous stable coins are not 100% backed by a bank deposit or U.S. treasuries. So what happens if they're 95% backed? Is that OK? Can we still call them stable coins? Well, maybe. What about 90%? What about 80%? What about 50%? It, there is no layman's real understanding and, co and common definition of what we really understand of what a stable coin is and what it really means. And then some of the literature that's been uh, that's been published recently goes back to history and about particularly in the US banking market about what happened when private banks. And I'm not talking about private banks in pinstripe suits. I'm talking about just privately owned banks in, in, in a century behind issuing their own paper and therefore the risks associated with that. And, and then those banks collapsing and then uh, being a precursor to the Great Depression. So the, the, the meaning and understanding of stable coins and about what they're backed by, or do we mean asset backed tokens, is one that really we should explore on this panel today and about, well, what is the role of what's the, what's the meaning of, an asset, of a stable coin? Um, there are different types of stable coins in terms of the way they're structured. And, you've got, and, uh, and to be honest, we haven't heard much about algorithmic stable coins. But mm. algorithmic stable coins, the pricing works whilst you haven't got a big run because it, 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 it is pegged. But if you have 90% uh, redemption request, I'm sorry, then it looks like a Ponzi scheme. So I honestly believe that the definition and the understanding of stable coins is a big issue of common understanding. And uh, we can't hide behind the fact that we're crypto people and therefore, it, oh, every stable coin is okay. I'm not going to go any further from that, Lewis, because I'm just saying it is an unanswered question. Mm. And if people think they know the answer, that doesn't matter. The layman on the street doesn't know the answer. And that is what matters. Yeah. Yeah. An excellent point. Um, so we have we've got the, uh, you know, backed stable coins where there's assets um, sort of there to defend the peg. And then, uh, or you know, depository, depository stable coins where it might be, you know, deposits held at a bank. Uh, but then, as you say, algorithmic stable coins where there's uh, a different asset peg to, to maintain the, the value. We'll go into that in a little bit more depth um, in just a moment. But I'd just like to, um, to let the audience know that we have a poll uh, that we're running today. So uh, you can interact with that on the swap card platform. So the question is, do stable coins have a role to play? in a jurisdiction where CBDC exists, uh, or uh, yes or no. So um, yeah, if, if, if a central bank uh, offers its own digital currency, uh, is there still a function for, for stable coins in, 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 in that context? Um, Christian, let's, let's come to you uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, algorithmic stable coins because that is going to lead us into Terra and what's gone wrong there. Yeah, so maybe, you know, as, as a framing, I, I like to divide stablecoins into two broad categories, uh, the ones that are claiming or, or trying to be fiat backed. And so there, there's a whole vertical ladder of quality where, of course, if you have 90 days or less US treasuries and cash and cash equivalents, maybe you also add capital buffers, uh, according to Basel III, then essentially you have something that looks a lot like a narrow bank. And we have a framework for that. We have a way of thinking about that. We have a way of protecting those objects from, from runs, um, very much like you know some of the progress that was made on money market funds after, after 2008. Um, the other category of algorithmic is, is, is the more problematic one. And there's no sound economic design for an algorithmic stable coin to date. And I wanna stress that again, we wrote a paper about this over a year ago I don't think anybody listened, at least in the crypto space. And now we're seeing the effects of something that's supposed to be stable, but is, of course, uh, subject to expectations. Algorithmic stable coins are clever instruments. And to some extent, I think the best that they'll ever be able to do until we have better tokenized assets on chain, um, it's going to be, you know, maintaining stability under some conditions. Uh, now, of course, if you're using this for retail, consumer application, merchant payments, that you know, uh, 
stable most of the time condition is, is not good enough. And from a consumer protection perspective, it's definitely not something that you want to put in the hands of the broader public. Now, these objects may have a different role in, in the crypto space, but we shouldn't call them stable coins. To some extent, stable coin is a misnomer. It portrays this idea of stability. But when it comes to the algorithmic ones, to some extent, old stable coins function in the following way. They take assets, uh, typically, you know, payment and fiat, they convert that into some reserve assets, and then eventually they need to make those reserve assets available for redemptions sometime in the future. And in that time gap, that's where the problems arise, because if what you put in the reserve loses value, uh, maybe because there's a market shock, interest rate shock, or, or whatever the concern might be, um, you won't be able to meet redemptions at par, no matter what you're trying to do. And I, I think computer scientists have been really clever on the algorithmic ones. Uh, there's models that essentially replicate the dynamics of a basic central bank. The challenge being that there's no economy behind it. There, there's typically no um, infrastructure the way we know it in, in macro. And so what we're seeing today in one of these, um, you know, algorithmic stable coins, but all of them suffer from the same problem, is that we've experienced stable coins in a period where crypto was growing, crypto was booming, expectations were trending up. Whenever there's a correction or an attacker, like likely in this case, uh, that realizes that these objects are fragile and wants to you know, close an arbitrage opportunity, um, these, these coins are unable to, to really defend their peg because when you think about it in the most abstract sense, they're trying to link to something that's only defined offline, in this case, the US dollar, with assets that are living, breeding online. And so there's a major discrepancy. You're trying to track something in the real world with something else. Um, Typically, the way they do it is they create an equity token of sorts. Think of it almost like stock and equity in a company. Uh, it's really equity in the ecosystem. And so as the ecosystem grows, that equity is worth a lot. And these coins are often over collateralized, 2x, 3x, maybe even more. Uh, but if expectations change, of course, the equity in, in that ecosystem depreciates in value. And the whole thing is self-fulfilling. In fact, these stable coins are so fragile that even in a scenario where the ecosystem is robust and healthy, if expectations erroneously believe that there's a risk, uh, you know, there could be a price drop in the value of that equity, a run on the reserve. And despite, I think, very clever design mechanisms from Tobin tax equivalents to all sort of like gates and fees, things we've seen in the real world elsewhere, um, all those measures are actually to make matters worse. Uh, because people will understand that if I run today, if I run right now, maybe I'll get 80 cents on a dollar instead of 60. The whole thing precipitates and these objects run to close to zero or whatever the remaining value of the reserve assets could be. In some designs, the remaining value is going to be zero because the only thing to back that issuance is actually equity in the ecosystem. So that's kind of the hours of cards that we're witnessing. And unfortunately, you know, it, it, it discredits the entire space because I think mean, these objects were well designed especially the fiat back ones where we have a banking framework around it, like in the PWG report in the United States, uh, can be useful to society, can improve competition in payments and, and really improve our situation when it comes to financial services. Yeah, fantastic. And, and that's what we've seen with, with Terra where the, the stable coin was uh, backed by convertibility to Luna, which uh, they, had, they were offering a 19.5% return based on uh, the staking of the reserves, which, uh, it's in that context it seems kind of unsurprising that this uh that the way this has gone uh, I, I guess that was probably in the post um you mentioned that there might be some i, I think we can probably all agree that uh a stable coin on built on that kind of framework is uh can never be a systemically important part of uh of a well-designed financial system uh for for mass use uh you mentioned i think that there might be some limited or narrow use cases where a stable coin like that might might work um christian or, or anyone on the panel is that something in what context might might a, a system like that be valuable first we should probably stop calling them stable coins i think it's better to sure. call them collateralized lending platforms hmm. essentially all, all of what these platforms do you you post some asset as collateral it could be equity in the ecosystem it could be some other crypto asset and you're borrowing out of it a stable-ish asset on the other end now, if you think of them as collateralized lending, you realize that they're much more risky objects than they look like. I think there will be a role for some of these objects, especially as we bring better forms of collateral. Uh, some people are thinking about, you know, carbon credits. Can we start creating uh, baskets of assets that, that maybe, you know, help us uh, with, with the climate challenge? Um, I, I think you would see these objects, but I, hopefully, you know, they'll be 
branded and marketed and, and, and described in a proper way. Uh, they may have a, a narrow use case within crypto. They may have broader application in the long run, but right now they're definitely not stable coins. Sure. Yeah. I mean, perhaps uh -huh. just to add something to what Krishna is saying, I think it's useful to make sure we're clear when we talk about digital assets, whether the objective is for them to have to be a means of payments or, or just to be an, a source of investment. And so it's not a problem for an asset to not have a stable value if it's an investment. People can have views on, on whether it's a good investment or a bad investment, and that should affect its price. When it's supposed to be a means of payments, it's very important that it has a stable value. And as Christian was saying, only certain designs will be able to create that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, let's let's talk. Let's move for a moment from from these algorithmically uh, defined collateralized lending platforms um, rather than stable coins, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, deposit backed or or um, yeah stable coins uh, that have a reserve to protect the peg within the within the banking framework. Um, I think. Well, let's let's talk about our poll question and get the views for, of the panelists. Uh, yeah, well, let's yeah, let's talk about the the, the framework first. Uh, can that be the foundation of an effective financial system? And then perhaps is it undercut by the provision of a central bank digital currency? Uh, Duncan, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'm gonna uh, thank you for the question. I'm gonna start with a rhetorical question though, which is, why do we have stable coins in the first place? All right. And uh, what I started getting involved in the ecosystem in 2017 um, and um, everybody was talking about Bitcoin and Ethereum okay and then people wanted then there was a, a large mass of people that just basically wanted to put some money into something that wasn't as speculative as volatile as Bitcoin and Ethereum so they wanted some something that looked and felt like fiat all right conjecture question if we had had a US dollar Fed backed central bank digital currency back then, what would people have flocked to? Would they have flocked to Tether? Would they have flocked to stable coins? Or would they have gone to CBDCs? But my answer to that, because I can't, we can't ask the question in this forward one here, my answer is probably both. I think a large number would have gone to a central bank digital currency if, on two things, they were okay to forgive anonymity, because you're going to lose that. And if we're all prepared to pay the back taxes, well, I work for PwC and I therefore, I'm, of course, I'm going to pay my taxes. So therefore, I personally would have gone to a, um, a central bank digital currency. And I think many other people would, but not everybody. So I think there is a room for stable coins for those who just want, pro probably who want to maintain anonymity and that, for, for that main reason. So they have got a role. But if central bank digital currencies had been in vogue and widely available in history, then my uh, proposition is that stable coins wouldn't have had the dominance that they have today. Mm -hmm. And maybe that, if, if people agree with me, maybe that is a, a, ground, a ground setting for what may happen in the future. Yeah. So I hope that is an, an acceptable answer to your question. You may not oh, agree I with Certainly. Well, Anastasia, let's let's get your thoughts on that. Well, from our customers, we have observed that many central banks are investigating both stable coins and central bank digital currency at the same time or in parallel, regardless of what your definition is. And obviously, there's it's a complex definition for both of them uh, based on the discussion. They are actually being perceived as being part of the same conversation. In fact, many central banks have shared in public forums uh, that they would not start working on CBDCs without seeing the demand or rise of stable coins. And many central banks have also expressed uh, interest in leveraging the stable coins infrastructure uh, and, and user base to distribute CBDCs in the future. Of course, some central banks also see the tension between the two, between CBDCs and stable coins. But from that perspective, one could still argue that stable coins have played uh, uh, an integral role as a catalyst for CBDC research and development. Um, I think it's too early to tell what the end game between CBDCs and stable coins is going to be considering all the outstanding questions and the ongoing debate. But at least for now, 
uh, monitoring and observing the global expansion of stable coins provides central banks with valuable knowledge, many lessons learned and, uh, learned and best practices as they explore the feasibility of CBDCs. Yeah, it's a very interesting point. I think, uh, yeah, there's certainly central banks who would be a lot further behind in, in their development with uh, uh, the development of stable coins that we've seen. However, um, I was just going to highlight a question from the audience, which I think is, uh, is relevant at this point. Um, and, and really places stable coins as a, as a threat. So can we stop the proliferation of stable coins and the challenge that it poses to fiat and CBDC in, in the long run? So uh, Antoine, um, it, well, is there a need to, I mean, possibly if you, if you develop a CBDC, uh, uh, any proliferation will, will, uh, will be kind of stymied by, by the existence of a state option. But yeah, what do you think, Antoine? Right, so um, let me uh, first uh, remind everybody that whatever I say are my personal views and they may not represent the views of the Fed. And, and I should also say uh, on the topic of CBDC that the, the Board of Governors has released a, uh, a discussion paper in January uh, and, and with, a, with a list of questions um, and people can still um, provide uh, their comments and uh, until May 20th, I believe. So I, I encourage people to check that uh, discussion paper out and to provide uh, any comments that, that they think um, are useful. Uh, so, I mean, I think that, so there's, there's two important questions. So first, uh, as Duncan was telling us earlier, it's important to, to, to make sure we, we know what we're talking about when we talk about stablecoin. And it's, I think it's pretty clear that we don't want a proliferation of algorithmic stablecoins for the reason that Christian described earlier. It's not entirely obvious why we don't want well-regulated, um, stable coins that are backed by, say, high quality liquid assets. Um, and, and those are not necessarily that different from what a CBDC could be or would be. And so in, in economics, you know, a researcher, one, one of the questions we often ask ourselves when we're trying to think about whether there's a role for government intervention is, well, could the private sector deliver something that does essentially the same? And I think that's the question we have to ask ourselves as a central bank. Is there something that a central bank digital currency can do that is impossible to do by a well-regulated competitive private sector? And I think the, the answer is not obvious. I certainly don't have it. But I think that's the lens through which it's useful to, to, to think about these questions. So the point is not to stamp out stable coins as long as they're well-regulated. Um, in, in, in that, as long as we uh, have a handle on the kind of risk they could introduce in our financial system. Mm. Yeah, I mean, as you say, it's difficult to, in a world where almost every transaction we do is digital, that means it's in it's in private money. It's not in central bank liability. And generally speaking, we're pretty comfortable with, uh, with that. So uh, it's just a question of... Uh, you know, we're comfortable with it because it's uh, it's within a regulated banking system. And uh, in effect, it's mostly guaranteed by the state uh, in any case, up to a pretty large amount. Um, another question that I think is relevant here from the from the audience, um, which points out. Uh, so this is from Ali Akhaled, the uh, from the Central Bank of Kuwait, and he's asked that if, if a CBDC exists in the jurisdiction, would a stable coin uh, I suppose from another jurisdiction, pose a risk of currency substitution if it's used by a population across borders. Um, is that uh, yeah? Is, is that is that a concern that that you guys are um, I think is a reasonable concern for for central banks, Duncan? Okay. Uh, uh, before we answer that question, can we just uh, pose another question to draw a comparison here, a corollary? If you, in Kuwait, let's say for example. Are you worried about people settling transactions using euro or US dollars? If the answer to that is yes, then I would say, OK, then the same answer is here, because we need to think about the end of the day. Stable coins is just if they could be a means of settlement. If it's going to be a, a concern or worry, then it's the same concern of any other type of means of payment. So um, uh, later on on this uh, on this um, on this panel, I think we're going to uh, finish off with regulation about how to regulate stable coins. If you're going to do that, is it through issuance, redemption, purpose, payment mechanisms? So I think it depends on on the views of a regular of a central bank as to how you view the use of anything for a major payment mechanism in your territory, uh, and whether or not it's a stable coin or another currency. I think it's the same concept. Is there yeah, not issue for the Fed? So I'm going to be very interested to hear what you say. Hmm. 
Is there not an issue that a stable coin might be more readily accessible uh, than... Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But Antoine, what do you think? Yeah. So my personal view is uh, go along the line of what Lewis was just saying. So uh, we know that there are some economies that are dollarized, uh, mm -hmm. where they've adopted another currency uh, in day-to-day -day transactions. And this is more complicated to do when the transact when the, the currency is uh, you know um, pieces of papers or, or, or coins in metal than when it's uh, electronic. And so I think that if you're a foreign jurisdiction and it, there are good quality stable coins that are uh, you know, that you can rely on or feel are, are well pegged to the U.S. dollar, then it is possible that this could uh, be a source of competition more so than uh, than is currently the, the issue with dollarization. So yes, I think that that's potentially a concern. Christian, I'd like to get your thoughts on that as well, because uh, with your background... Yeah. I think it's a I mean, there, there is a simple solution to that issue, which is, you know, what, what is the stablecoin perimeter? When we think about payment systems, typically, you know, there, there's entry points to that. And so a stablecoin that moves on rails that only allow regulated VASP, so virtual asset service providers, can, can implement all the controls that we have today. And, and that would look a lot more like, you know, an enhanced, more uh, interoperable, low friction payment system. Uh, that said, I think it's important to consider that regardless of what happens within the more regulated stable coins and the ones that may follow those rules, the Libra Diem design, for example, was, was proposing such a framework to, to avoid not only, you know, dollarization, but also uh, odd money flows uh, or, or, or sort of capital outflows from regions that don't want uh, funds to leave, especially in a crisis, um, is that all these objects will compete with crypto native solutions that will eventually get some degree of stability. Again, the algorithmic stablecoins may not be a threat today, but I think they will be some are viable and people will use them. And mm -hmm. those will be much harder to, to control, uh, especially if they allow for unhosted wallets and, and, and kind of direct access to the network. So whatever our framework for AML, CFT sanctions will look like for crypto at large, I think we'll, we'll probably address some of these issues too for stablecoins. Uh, maybe jumping ahead here, but uh, is the existing regulatory framework adequate at the moment to to restrict those concerns i mean as you say it's, it's one thing to talk about like a large uh, a large scale stable coin which is going to be following the rules but uh it's pretty low barriers to to set something like this up and do is there uh a global framework for for dealing with with issues like that no <laughs> and we have large very large market cap stable coins yeah. even in the fiat back category Mm. that allow today all sort of activity, including potentially financial crime, you know, sanction evasion and more. Yeah. And just one, one point on that. So, so there's two different issues, I think. One is there's a bunch of stuff that's very, very hard to regulate because they don't intend to be regulated and they're operating on decentralized platform. Mm -hmm. um, there's a second issue, which is among the uh, providers who, who want to be regulated, uh, the, whole, the entire point of crypto is to come up with new ways of doing things. And it is the way regulators typically approach things is, well, how can we fit the new things into an existing framework? That seems like a, a good way forward. But it's also possible that some of the things that are going to come up just don't really fit neatly in the framework we currently have. So I think we need to be open to that possibility and think about, and this is the job of Congress, not of the Fed, but think about like how do we want to uh, regulate activities that are sufficiently different from what we know now because technology allows that to happen. Yeah. Okay, so now we've moved on to regulation. Could I could I offer a challenge on that, Ben? Please do. Um, all right. So, which is, it, please, can I ask people to imagine you are on a spaceship coming in from Mars, looking at the Earth? Okay, and you went, and and you've never been here before. Okay, you've never been here before, and you look at this 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 thing that's quite blue with green blobs all over it, and the green blobs are different countries. And if you if you were arriving, you've never been on Earth before. You're going to say, "Well, how does this work? how does this place work?" We know that there are some people on there that do business with each other. How does it work? And they're all doing stuff into you know people from one green blob working and transacting with another green blob. You think, oh, okay, they must do work in harmony, working in you know, there must be a way of uh, an agreed rules and reconciliations. Then you land and you realise, oh my goodness, we've got rules and regulations on each green blob. Because the way that we've grown up since I was since we were all born is that we've got rules and regulations that are built on territory specific, country nationalistic rules and regulations. But crypto doesn't work like that. 
it works on a global, uh, uh, totally connected basis. So Antoine, you were talking about US Fed regulations. Yeah, okay, that works. That works. And I know you've got extraterritoriality in the US from, uh, from FATCA and stuff like that, but the world doesn't work on a totally globally harmonized rules and regulations basis. But, uh, but stable coins do on a peer, and Christian, I, I agree your point about VASPs, et cetera, but on a peer-to-peer -peer basis where you can move things across on wallets and private, we don't have a global way of regulating stable coins in a harmonized manner. And if we're gonna regulate things properly in stable coins, that's the only thing that can work, unless you're gonna do things on a territory specific basis, which works on issuance, redemption, and maybe some form of purpose within a territory. But outside of your territory, you ain't got a chance. Thank you, Duncan. Um, yeah, so it's a very good point. And I, yeah, it's not, if it were easy to develop that kind of global regulatory framework, it, we would have done it already, not just for, uh, not just for stable coins. Um, yeah. I want to I want to return um, to something we were discussing a little bit earlier, uh, just based on a, a question from the from the audience. We were talking about um, potential use cases for a stable coin that a CBDC might not occupy. Um, one of the well, probably the single biggest uh, value proposition for stable coins as they are today is as a means of uh, parking liquidity when engaging in crypto trading. Uh, would you anticipate CBDCs to fill that role as neatly as stablecoins currently do? Is that something that the central bank wants its uh, its obligations to to be to be involved in? That's a question from Elliot Hentoff from uh, uh, SSGA. Be happy to start. Um, I, I, I think the issue here is that we're thinking of them as competing with each other, stablecoins and CBDCs. I think they will be much more of a complement. And there's a really good reason, which is safety, security, and resilience. CBDC will be the bedrock of the payment system in any country where it's developed. And it's going to have a very high requirement for safety and security, cyber, and, and, and not. Um, and so you will have to limit functionality on top by design. I mean, the more you, you make a CBDC programmable, extensible, the more risky you introduce in the system. And so I see that part of the experimentation to be not only better carried, but also more likely to succeed when done by the private sector and potentially also permissionless networks. So you could imagine a future where the central bank is in charge of monetary policy of issuing you know, the, the coin and, and, and backing uh, that, that runs the economy. And then different networks, including stable coins can move value uh, in different ways with more programmability with different risk profiles, whether it's payments, fintech, DeFi, all of those, I, I think will be on the higher levels of the stack. I mean, that's how we developed the internet. It's not that we placed everything on, on a single protocol and all the risk in, in, in one bucket. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I, I just want to add that um, uh, my colleague, Michael Lee, and, uh, and I and, and some colleagues from the IMF have a blog post where we sort of do this thought experiment. We say, well, suppose you have a CBDC. Uh, now, what is a, a stable coin backed by assets right now? You, you, you take assets and then you create your, your stable coin. Well, you could use CBDC as the asset backing your stable coin. Now, you might ask, well, why would you do that? One reason might be because you think that you have a better uh, you know, consumer interface. Perhaps the CBDC doesn't, isn't as convenient as what the private sector could do. So I think uh, this is one example uh, along the line of what Christian was, was suggesting that, that they, these can be complement instead of substitute. You can build on uh, what, uh, what a CBDC is offered, supposing it is offered, uh, to, um, to build private sector solution. And so I think that, that that's a more promising way uh, to think about, about these, these types of problem in my view. Yeah, very interesting point. Thank you. Uh, Duncan, did you want to add something there? Or? No, I, I think, seriously, Antoine and Christian have, um, uh, have, have yeah. spoken about what I, uh, I've got nothing to add what they've mm. got to settle the question. Well, I'll just interject the results of our poll at this point then, because it's relevant. Uh, uh, so do stable coins have a role to play in a jurisdiction with CBDC? 62% uh, say yes and 38% say no, which I suppose reflects what you're talking about. Uh, there is uh, ways in which they can complement each other and, and not, uh, uh, yeah, not, not encroach on each other's territory. Um, excellent. Okay, uh, fantastic. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the 
you know, we're, we were talking primarily about policy questions here, but this is still a nascent technology. And I wanted to, to come to you, Anastasia, to, to ask a little bit about, uh, yeah, where, where are the technical hurdles that still need to be overcome or, or are we pretty much there and it's just a question of setting the rules now? No, there, there are technical issues and, and hurdles that need to be overcome. First of all, digital asset platforms are difficult to set up. Uh, they require enabling technologies such as digital identity, technical standards, and interoperability mechanisms. And then you have uh, the digital uh, asset infrastructure is difficult to scale. So you go from setup to, to scaling. It's, it's complex to operate and manage, and it's facing increasing cyber and other security risks. And then finally, you have the monitoring. You know, you need monitoring tools for compliant customer onboarding, uh, supervision of intermediaries, minimization of uh, illicit activities. You need all of those tools. Uh, but all of those are still related going back to the, the, the policy side. So beyond these core technology hurdles, central to any design, uh, design decisions should be the understanding of the relationship between the policy objectives and the technology design choices. There is no one size fits all. There's no singular design model. This having a clearly designed problem statement and policy priorities is a critical first step as design choices will be impacted by those policy motivations, uh, the overall appetite for adopting new technologies and the competitive uh, landscape and dynamics. So aligning the technology uh, design choices to those policy objectives is a, is a core requirement. And uh, coincidentally, uh, that's actually the focus of a white paper my team uh, recently published. We co-authored with Oliver Wyman called uh, Retail Central Bank uh, Digital Currency from Vision to Design. Uh, the, the paper itself is designed to provide central bankers, technologists, and impacted stakeholders with a framework to understand where policy and technology are likely to collide and then make their decisions accordingly. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, on a sort of related topic, um, well, we, we have a sort of we have a follow up uh, question uh, for you, Christian, on the uh, from the Central Bank of Kuwait about the the concept of you know perimeterizing stable coins to to limit this, uh, and the reason I come to it now is that I'm wondering if there's a technological solution to to the problem, or if that's something that only that it can only be addressed from a regulatory perspective. I mean, the the solution can be regulatory first. Uh, again, making sure that the only entities that are allowed to custody funds are regulated best. Uh, but in the future, you could imagine. Um, and, and this is an area where I think, you know, both regulatory frameworks and technology will have to co-evolve for having, you know, to deliver a workable solution. Uh, you could have a model where KYC and an identity protocol supports the equivalent. So I could hold an unhosted resource, uh, but at the same time, I get, you know, someone to certify that I've KYC'd myself. Um, and then, you know, you apply restrictions based maybe on my nationality or place of residence, uh, whatever is needed. So I think in the short term, it's going to have to be regulated participants like digital wallets, exchanges, uh, all the ones we know. In the future, I think it can be a lot more flexible, but that requires, you know, better identity systems, better ways of thinking about KYC and, and in general doing compliance, travel rule, all the things that we have in traditional payments on, on a permissionless blockchain, for example. Yeah, yeah. But I suppose, uh, as, as we mentioned before, there is kind of always the way around for the the instruments that are by design unregulated peer to peer, like it's very difficult to restrict access to uh, to those completely in a way that people can't circumvent. Um, for those, uh, really briefly, I, I, I think to some extent, if the majority of consumers and businesses will use regulated entities to access, you know, crypto, uh, then you kind of sort of solve the problem because anyone that will use those won't be able to come back into the regulated part of the economy. Now, that said, there could be an unregulated part that, that's problematic, but I think at that point it might be much easier to identify uh, on a blockchain. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, we have an interesting question here uh, from the Technical Observatory uh, from the Central Bank of Chile from uh, Leon Sanz Bunster. Uh, he's positing a situation where we have a new type of financial system where banks, or I suppose it could be any any institution, could create money without full deposit insurance, and uh, and people could 
store money there and accept a, a level of discount or premium in the value of the money they have there versus uh, versus the central bank equivalent. Um, is that an idea that uh, you feel like will have any traction or, uh, yeah, what do you think about that? Duncan? I see, I, 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 I will share something here. Um, I, you can probably tell from my accent that I'm British. Um, so, uh, and, I, and I came back this way, I grew up in England. And yeah, the, the, the Bank of England was the one that printed notes. That was the note issue with uh, um, currency. I moved to this place called Hong Kong because it was, it was a fast, but furious place. I love it, I'm still here. I absolutely love living here. One of the unique things about Hong Kong is that the, the printing of notes, and therefore to, to your, your, uh, the, the, the question, the printing of notes is not done by the central bank. The central, the central bank devolves authority by, uh, by, by, uh, by bonds issued to three note issuing banks in Hong Kong. So the banks themselves are the ones that print the money and issue the money in Hong Kong. Now they are fungible and it works across. So in some respects from a net, from a, you know, on the street, it makes no difference as to whether or not, you know, who cares whether or not you got a, a, a Hong Kong dollar note issued by the Hong Kong Monetary Authority or the Bank of China, et cetera. It doesn't make any difference. So to the point your, to your question is that yes, you can do that. Um, as long as you've got that authority granted by the central bank down to whatever institution they want to have, it's probably going to be a licensed bank and it's probably going to be a very, very heavily licensed bank. And there are already three in Hong Kong. So you can do that through mechanisms. Um, and I don't, I'm not aware of any other country in the world that's got that uh, a unique setup, but it is very, very important for central banks to think about that. If they want to go down through a CBDC strategy, you don't have to be issuing it at the central bank level. So uh, earlier, about 15 minutes ago, we were talking about, well, does a central bank want to go through the costs of doing that? Mm. You don't need to. You can actually devolve authority to do that. As long as it's the same infrastructure, common uh, uh, interoperable, interoperability platform that's used by the, the CBDC issuing banks, problem solved, cost away from the central bank. Yeah, well... Uh Sorry, I was just going to say, Duncan, uh, you can probably tell from my accent that I'm Scottish and you didn't need to go all the way to Hong Kong. We've, I grew up using notes oh, Bank of Scotland, Bank of yeah. Phil and Bank of Scotland, so didn't have to go quite that far. But um, yeah. <laughs> sorry, Anton, I'll let you uh, continue. Yeah, I just want to add something. So I think Duncan makes a very important point, which is that you want to maintain fungibility. Um, and, and if you look at the history of the United States during the state banking era, um, banks were allowed to issue their own notes. And the problem is that they, they, those notes weren't fungible. They, they traded at discounts depending on, on where you were correspond, uh, relative to, to where the, the, the issuing bank was. And I think this is something you absolutely want to avoid in any future system where people have to constantly be thinking about what is this stable coin worth versus that stable coin and how do you tr turn one into the other. For, when we think of payments, we want to have something that's very simple to use, where there's a constant value, and this fungibility that Duncan mentioned is essential. Thank you, Antoine. Um, yeah, it's an excellent point. Uh, sticking with you, Antoine, I wanted to... A lot of the uh, progress that has happened over the past 10 years in, in this space has been driven based on the innovation of distributed ledger technology. And uh, I think a big part of the question here is, is that actually a material improvement? I mean, I think it's it's interesting that uh, it seems to me that a lot of central banks are are moving away from um, from distributed ledgers and that that sort of way of doing things when they think about how they're going to do their own um, their own CBDCs. But it's still quite a still quite a popular. Uh, probably a core feature of, of stable coins. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess uh, the idea of a stable coin is having an on-chain asset. So uh, what's your perspective on, on that? And if, if it's, yeah, it will remain part of the, the solution going forward? Yeah, so I think this is a great question. And I, I want to um, discuss a little bit this idea of like why, why are people coming up with stable coins, right? So at first you had Bitcoin and that was just not a very good means of payments and people want to be able to have liquidity, want to have something with a stable value. So the first thing that people thought about is the most obvious thing that we've tried in the past to say, well, you could back it with an asset that has stable value. We know that works. Uh, we know that works better as Christian was saying, if you have high quality assets than low quality assets, but, but that's a very well understood process that, that we've done before 
you know, off chain. And then some people say, well, but we don't want to have to depend on trusted third parties. So we need to have algorithmic stable coin. But the problem is what, what problem are we trying to solve? So to your point, I think the jury's still out uh, whether or not uh, DLTs will be a better way of conducting transfers, payments than, than existing technologies. But let's for a second assume it is. Then the question we should ask ourselves is what is the best type of assets to circulate on that? And it's really not obvious that the, re the way we've been trying to solve that problem is the right way to go. So I think we need, you know, economists, people like, like Christian, to sort of think deeply about like what is the right kind of assets? Um, because stable, you know, the, the back stable coin have the kinds of problem that historically these these off-chain assets had when, when we tried to build them. Uh, algorithmic stable coins are new, but we already know that, uh, that they don't work very well. One of the things we know that has worked very well is bank deposits. And if you could tokenize bank deposits and have them on DLT, would that be a good way of making payments? I think that's, we, so we need to ask ourselves this question, you know, what, what kind of asset do we want to circulate on these platform that would be better than the, the, the failed experience, some of the failed experiments that we're seeing? Yeah, thank you, uh, Antoine. Uh, related to that, we actually have another question from uh, from the audience. Art Linton from Versa Bank has asked if we have thoughts on the role of Chartered Bank issuing digital deposits as stable coins. So uh, he mentioned the Canadian Chartered well, Versa Bank is on institution announcing uh, VCAD, uh, VCAD. Um, and yeah, it seems like that's the sort of, uh, it's a means of getting uh, whatever advantages there are to be accrued from trading on chain uh, with a type of money that we're very comfortable with using. Yeah. Uh, Duncan, did you want to add something there? No, um, excellent. Okay, terrific. Um, yeah, so I think. Uh, yeah, well, in answer to Art Linton's question, I think, uh, yeah, generally speaking, we we like that idea. It seems like a, a quite a neat solution. Um, it might be worth at this point. Well, uh, Antoine, you said the jury is out, but um, does anyone else have anything to add on what the advantages of settling transactions on blockchain are versus you know conventional conventional settlement systems? Can I? Can I? Uh, I will throw, and, and this applies to both stablecoins and CBDCs. Um, some, some people and probably may may well be my vintage. I started work in the eighties, and the biggest uh, the, the biggest uh, um, change of, in the financial services industry in my working career happened in I think uh, 1985, 1986, with Big Bang in London when the equities world moved from open outcry to uh, automated trading. And at that time, we had a T plus five trade date plus five settlement. Okay, um, today. We sit in a world where quite a lot of markets are T plus two. So, in some respects, you know, the securities industry needs to, and I said this in November, the securities industry needs to give themselves a round of applause for making three days progress in 30 years. Because that's what's happened. Okay. We haven't changed the infrastructure. Settlement takes T plus two. Now, if you have, um, uh, equities trading on a, a DLT platform, whether it's permissioned or, or permissionless, that's that's academic. If you have it on a DLT platform and you have settlement linked also to a uh, a means of settlement, whether it's a CBDC or, or, or a stable coin, that's also on a DLT, you can have atomic settlement. So you can go from T plus two to T plus zero, immediate settlement. Now I'm not I'm not advocating 247365 trading because you get liquidity issues in the equities market, but at least you could then get rid of all settlement issues and all this like reconciliations of, of, of fund transfers. So I do believe that there are some very fundamental advantages to be putting certain settlement mechanisms, get rid of the to outside of the correspondent banking network, put them on a DLT. And you will you will make it a lot more efficient for society, and that's for the good of the world. Yeah, thank you, uh, Anastasia. Anything you wanted to to add on on the value there? I agree. I think the decision needs to be made of what you want to put on that system. You know, from from Amazon's uh, uh, AWS's perspective, uh, we support the central banks and 
and their digital transformation and, and their innovations going forward. And we have various services that we can provide to them. We have Amazon Managed Blockchain, we have SageMaker, we have uh, Internet of Things, all which of which could be configured for digital asset networks and, and infrastructure, making it scalable, resilient, and easily managed. Uh, and our customers can also leverage both centralized and decentralized architectures uh, provided by AWS to accelerate the development and deployment of the digital assets. And then, of course, we have the, our, our full suite of security tools uh, to stay ahead of bad actors. So really, it's, it's the decision just needs to be made of what they want to do. But uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, uh, the, you know, the, the, the building blocks are there. We haven't touched on the idea of uh, fungibility, uh, of, of sorry, of programmability as a as a feature of distributed ledger assets and, and stable coins in particular. But you know, some of the if we're talking about Internet of Things and things like that, uh, I guess a lot of the ways to leverage those kinds of technologies involve having a programmable payment system. Uh, is that is that fair? That is fair. Yeah. Yes. Um, we have a question from the audience uh, on that topic, which does the idea of programmable money threaten the concept of fungibility if you're uh, restricting the uses of, uh, of particular coins or, or something like that? For, for anyone who feels... I'm going to say potentially. However, I, I, I'm going to counter it with a different, different uh, concept. Imagine you are a, uh, um, a wheat grower in um, or a supplier in Midwest in America, and you are supplying some goods uh, to uh, Hong Kong, all right? And when those goods arrived in Hong Kong, when you, surely you wanna get paid when those goods arrive in the warehouse in Hong Kong. So when somebody signs on their goods receive note on a digital format, which is built, which is on a blockchain enabled um, uh, goods receive note facility, once you've signed that, if it's programmed also and linked to a CBDC or a stable coin uh, in terms of automatic settlement, you will get paid immediately and therefore essentially removing credit risk. You've got transportation settlement risk, but you get rid of counterparty uh, credit risk. And, and so many small businesses suffer from this. And so I do think that, you know, whilst there might be some restrictions that, that the, quest, the questioner uh, raised on, uh, on programmable money. There are some amazing benefits, particularly for small businesses that need to have those instantaneous and uh, instant uh, settlement for credit. Yeah, so I agree with Duncan. I want to add something. So I think that, like in, in a lot of other areas in, in these types of conversations, things are not super well defined. And so we're talking about slightly different things and that creates problem. So, so if you have the idea that programmable money means that there's some US dollars you can only use to buy pizza and some US dollars you can only use to buy beer, then clearly that kind of distinction is going to create problems with fungibility. And it's pretty clear we don't want that. But Duncan is talking about something that's very different. He, he's talking about payments that are conditional on other things. Now, once you've received those payments, you cannot only use them to buy pizza. You can use them to buy anything, but there is a conditionality. That's very valuable. So programmability that, that doesn't alter the, your ability to spend those dollars whenever you receive them, but that allows somebody to, to make some promises or commitments that, that, that that's very valuable. So there's a role for that. But of course, if you start tailoring your money too finely, then you're going to run into issues of fungibility. So I think it's important for us to think carefully about the kind of programmability we want and the kind of programmability we don't want. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and this is where the point of where technology and policy co collide come into play and why you need to have that strong policy vision and, and, and problem statement to begin with. Exactly. Uh, I just so it was Erica Salinas from Amazon who asked that question. I'd just like to um, highlight the digital currency, DCJPY, the digital currency Japanese yen uh, forum, who published a really interesting white paper uh, about a framework for this, that um, the idea, they, so essentially they have uh, an area for transacting, for, for transacting with it's digitized bank deposits essentially, but then there, there is also a, I believe it's called a business area where you essentially purchase uh, 
tokens that are ex exchangeable for regular currency but are programmable themselves so there you can add more conditions to that and uh it's but essentially they're payment orders for uh normal tokens uh so it's it's essentially adding that kind of flexibility that, that duncan and antoine were talking about i think um but yeah very worth uh looking into that white paper if it's the topic you're interested in um uh we've got a question here uh just curious as we have a solution to address all this, what the counter solution is. So I guess, uh, are we talking there about, um, sorry, let me just read this question. Um, yeah, is there, you know, we're, okay. If we have 181 different fiat currencies, a lot of central banks, a lot of 15,000 banks in the world, how is a ledger solution going to support the multi-currency numerous stakeholders and the transaction levels required to support uh, the volume of global retail transactions. And this is from Grant Cahoon, uh, CEO of Okani. So yeah, can, can stable coins uh, deal with the, uh, you know, the scale and complexity of, of our payments worlds? For sure. I, I think a lot of the scalability challenges uh, are, are something of the past. Uh, there's a number of different efforts from expanding layer ones to layer two transactions to completely new blockchains that don't have uh, throughput limits of the ones that we see in some of the permissionless chains. I, I think this is often raised as a concern, but it's it's honestly not keeping into account the pace of innovation in the space and how quickly things advance. Can I also um, throw? Uh, we haven't got anybody from the BIS on the um, on the panel today, uh, and it, but I, it, to answer that question, I wish we had. Um, the BIS is, um, is is advocating, and, and the, the, I have to say, I'm a big fan of what BIS are doing. They they are the sponsor of various different central bank digital currency projects and concepts around the world. They are not wedded to one platform or one uh, one solution yet, which is brilliant because they're actually letting the world explore. But one concept they have got, which is what they use for Hong Kong, Thailand, PBOC. Um, um, and the UAE is this concept of a multi-currency bridge. If you have um, a, a settlement mechanism where you have a one-to-one -one relationship with 181 currencies, I, I'm not the maths a mathematician, but that means you have to have it's thousands of different uh, uh, structures. But if you operate a hub and spoke model, which is the multi-currency uh, 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 central bank central currency bridge, everybody goes into one bridge, and then out of that bridge, you will only need 182. Uh, 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 routes and channels through. It does make it a little bit more cumbersome because every transaction into uh, into country has got two legs, one to the bridge and one out of the bridge. But it would work. Now, where will the world land? Well, all the central banks may end up landing in that model if a CBDC. I'm answering this from CBDC, not CBDC, it's not stable, it's not stable coin. Yeah. Uh, but that could be an ultimate solution. Which platform would it work on? Which blockchain protocol? Heaven knows. Um, it could yeah. be Ethereum. It could be something we haven't even thought about yet. Or to Christian's point, it could be a number of different blockchain protocols that are interoperable. But mm -hmm. we'll see. I wonder if, you know, related to that topic, uh, is that the kind of solution that uh, needs to be provided by state actors, by central banks, or can, can a private stablecoin uh, fill that kind of role? I mean, in some ways, uh, finality, not on the resale side, but it's, uh, yeah, can can that be done by by private actors? So if I may jump in, in general, uh, settlement platforms are going to end up being concentrated. There are huge economies of scales and network effect when it comes to settlement. And, and it's hard to imagine how you could overcome that. And so if it's going to be concentrated... Um, I think it's important that it's not be provided by a for-profit institution. It's not obvious whether a not-for-profit, say, user-owned type utility or an official sector entity is better. I think that's something that economists need to think more about. But it's pretty clear it's going to end up being concentrated, and you don't want to be, you don't want it to be in the hand of for-profit actors. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can see. I can see this is the sort of thing that uh could be provided as a, as a public good i mean obviously at the moment mostly provided by private actors but that's not but it's a distributed uh it's not uh one institution it's the correspondent banking network and so forth christian i'll add a provocative thought i mean to some extent permissionless networks are public goods uh they just follow different properties and and, and you could imagine a coexistence of both 
efforts like I, I think the important one at DBIS in connecting different CBDCs, I think we'll need that no matter what. Uh, and then other bridges um, between blockchains and between public and private infrastructure. The big challenge today with bridges is that, you know, probably after algorithmic stablecoins, there are another one of these uh, weak junctures in the crypto ecosystem, because when you connect different blockchains, if you don't have the right programmability on either side and the right standards, you're introducing additional risk. And we've seen a number of acts of large bridges like the War Mall one and, and others. Yeah, uh, yeah, an excellent point. Uh, we're running very short of time. Would either uh, Duncan or, or Anastasia uh, care to add anything on that? Um, no, but I, 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 but I think that this tension between um, uh, stable coins and CBDCs is going to continue for uh, quite a long time, if not for the rest of our working lives. Mm -hmm. I think what will be interesting to see is that where the uh, where the balance ends up between the uh, prevalence of usage uh, in five years, ten years time, um, and I do think it'll take that time uh, at least five years to stabilize in terms of that balance. Um, and maybe in, we, we would all look back at, at this panel and say, well, what were we saying then? <laughs> Any thoughts from you, Anastasia? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Wholeheartedly yeah. agree. Yeah. Uh, well, hopefully we'll all be able to reconvene this panel at the DMI Symposium 2027, 2028. Let's see. Um, but until then, uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, thank you to my panelists. It's been fantastic. Uh, really interesting topic. Uh, and to the audience, thank you for listening. Uh, do tune in 8.30 tomorrow morning for the next panel, which is Transformation Across Asia's Payments Landscape. Really interesting topic there, and I hope we'll see you then. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.